over the Christmas holidays, we had a little time for Zoom catch up with family in Chicago. Nacho, age six, had us in stitches. So in a few short months, he's grown from making eponymous strawberry-infused lemonade to embracing his inner rough and tumble. So in one sentence, he says, I don't believe in Santa Claus. He's not real. Quickly followed by, I want to punch him in the face. Yes, his fist was at the camera. So my sister dutifully responds that it's not appropriate to hit people. But Nacho's sister, who happens to be a few years older, was mildly embarrassed by his behavior, rolls her eyes and says, you're not cute. Nacho's response to Santa Claus had a really great resonance for me about how it is that we as a Christian community deal with our scriptures. On the one hand, we say, how real is this? And on the other hand, they can evoke for us very strong reactions that somehow affirm their reality, if not their historicity. So the events of today's gospel are attested in each of the four gospels. But that alone is not enough to certify that this was an historical event where Jesus was baptized by John. Rather, what certifies that this is definitely an historical event is the embarrassment that we hear from its human authors about how it is that the sinless Son of God submits to a ritual act of repentance administered by a poorly clad itinerant preacher named John. It is to nobody's advantage to make this up. The Gospel according to St. Mark deals with the embarrassment by making the Holy Spirit the primary actor. Luke, for his part, makes John Jesus' cousin, and then he places John in prison handily one verse before the baptism. John, the evangelist, explains the relationship between the Baptist and Jesus twice in this way. He who comes after me ranks ahead of me because he was before me. Then today we hear this account from the Gospel according to St. Matthew delivered with all the comfort of two middle schoolers at their first dance. John would have prevented Jesus saying, I, I, I need to be baptized by you and you come to me? Human beings are embarrassed because we are attached to our own notions of rank, of order, and decorum. And God, frankly, has other ideas and other plans. This is the story of baptism, the story of Jesus' baptism in the River Jordan, of our own, and of those 10 baptisms that we get to celebrate in a new Christian community today. In baptism, we make vows to live as Jesus did, and to help the Christian community to do the same, all with God's help. It means following the self-emptying way of Jesus, of the one who humbled himself in every way, who surrendered all the rights and privileges that attended his status and became a servant of the last and the least. Practically, it means looking to the wisdom of those who rank beneath us, and today I think especially of those who are young. Now, I'm not encouraging parents to be indulgent with their children. See, kids still learn the rules of the road, or they need to, to know that there is no pajama day at work in real life, and that grammatical sentences don't begin with, me and my friends, but guiding children, guiding children is also to affirm that true self, that I which God pronounces beloved, and that I that knows the grammar of the soul, that we only need to dress ourselves in Christ in the garments of baptism. 
A little self-knowing service can begin at any age. And so-called shortcomings need not be their stumbling blocks. When I think of young luminaries, I look to climate activist Greta Thunberg, who attests to her own neurodiversity as one of the primary sources of her dogged pursuit of justice for the planet and its creatures. I look to Amanda Gorman, who used navigating a speech impediment as a springboard to become the first youth poet laureate of Los Angeles, and then the first national youth po poet laureate. Much of her poetry devoted to righting the wrongs of oppression. Finally, I think of Malala Yousafzai, whose primary shortcoming was being born a girl. And then, after surviving an assassination, assassination attempt by a Taliban soldier who was intimidated by her outspoken advocacy, she continues to give her life so that women and girls can have equitable access to education. John would have prevented Jesus from being baptized, but Jesus responded, no. This is how we fulfill all righteousness. And then after Jesus was baptized, a voice spoke from the heavens and said, this is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Today, God looks upon us, upon you, and says, you are my beloved. This assurance doesn't stop with words. It unfolds in power, power propelling us to bring forth God's dream of justice for the world. We do that by listening attentively and without embarrassment yielding to the wisdom of those who are so precariously placed in this world by surrendering petty notions of rank or stature by becoming our true baptized selves and fulfillment of the righteous mission and destiny given to us by God. John would have prevented Jesus from being baptized, but Jesus said, no, this is how we fulfill all righteousness. What God in Christ commends to us is not the exaltation of stature, but service putting on the garments of baptism, together we can do and be a new thing to the glory of God and for the good of all creation.